Hello and welcome back to the Without Limits podcast. We are now at episode eight and I have another incredible guest in Mr. Steve Cook joining me for today's show. Steve was traveling to the UK on business and for some downtime and I hit him up and invited him to the world famous March on HQ for a training session. We followed that up with some food and then we sat down for this conversation. Steve is a true industry OG, one of the greats who many of you I'm sure already know. He's been ever present within this industry for as long as I can remember and is a shining example of just what can be achieved when you stay authentic to yourself and you take opportunities. We discussed his early experiences as a bodybuilder and competing on one of the biggest stages of all at the Olympia. We went on to discuss his endorsements with some of the biggest well-known household brands, such as Optum Nutrition and more recently Gymshark, before finally discussing life as it is in present day. He's still keen as an athlete, he can still throw it down, he's moving and transitioning now into more of a businessman, and he has so many lessons to impart on you guys as fitness professionals, as aspirational people within the fitness space, or people just looking to live a healthier life. I'm truly grateful that I got to sit down with one of the goats, such a humble and down to earth individual for someone who's achieved so much. And so as ever, if you like this episode, please like it, share it, leave us a comment. Any feedback is most welcome. And without further ado, here is episode eight, the true cost of becoming a fitness icon with Mr. Steve Cook. Steve Cook, welcome to the Without Limits podcast. How are you? I'm very good. How are you, mate? It's good to be here. A little train ride outside of London, not bad at all. I heard you uh, just before saying you're a little bit tired after sleeping out in Shoreditch. How, well, not sleeping out in Shoreditch, but staying in Shoreditch. How was that experience? You know, Shoreditch, we've stayed there a couple times and like it's good. We like hanging out there, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend staying there. It's just, you know, it's East London, there's some. A lot of parties going on. We're staying above a gentleman's club, actually. <laughs> and then the train somehow is close enough that it shakes the place as well, too. So I was like, yeah, this well, this isn't going to work. So I haven't been sleeping great, but, you know, that's just part of the traveling experience. You've always got a place to stay in Harpen and Maine. Hey, this is a here. nice little area. Yeah, like, it's it is cool, nice. It's a cool town. It's a cool it town. Is. And you have you grew up here? For the best part of, yeah, 32 years I've been here. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, this is home. It's nice. Is there? You said good schools in the area. Too? Good schools, uh, like I said, good commu- good commuter links into into London and yeah. into Europe. Um, low crime rate, such wood yeah. that stays that way. Yeah, safe. Good good restaurants. Good brunch bars. Good coffee. Sounds like I would live in in this yeah, place. Big, I'm not yeah. a city guy, so it's like I, I like going to the city, but I like leaving the city. Like when I lived in LA, I quickly realized I'm more of a go to LA, leave LA than 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 live there. So I mm. feel like I'd be in a place like this. And this actually kind of felt like. There's a little family vibe, like you said, little coffee shops everywhere. It, was, it almost felt Australian too, like yeah. just cool. We'll give you the full work. So once we've trained, we'll take you out for some food. Okay. So you'll get the full I experience. I like it. So listen, we start always by asking people like what without limits, a life without limits means to them. So when you think about those words without limits, yep. you've had a illustrious career in the, in the fitness space. And I think you, you've, you've identified as many different beacons for a lot of fitness um, enthusiasts coming up so what does without limits mean to you because you're constantly pushing yeah i would think with without limits is just being able to do living how i want to live when i want to live that way and what i mean by that is is whether it's traveling whether it's staying at home building businesses whether it is you know spending more time with family i think um living without limits is basically having that freedom through discipline to really be in control of your life and make those decisions. That's, you know, that's without limits to me. It's like, and I don't think you can get to those places. Everyone thinks, oh, like this freedom lifestyle, this nomadic. No, it's like you have to have discipline. With discipline, actually, you get more freedom. And that's such a weird concept for people. Sick. Love that. We've had some great answers, mate, and that, that tops uh, a lot of them. So thank you very much. Moving on, man. Wh- where did it all start? I- I've been a huge fan of you for as long as I can remember. Everyone that I've said in the, in the office, you know, Steve's coming on. It created a lot of a lot of buzz. I- everyone just knows you. You're the modern day godfather of fitness, as I see it. Like, <laughs> like genuinely. And um, I-, I I compliment people very sparsely, and I, I, I think you are that. you are a-, a shining example of what the fitness industry should be about. Thanks. I think you've like I said, you, you've you've achieved such great things, which we'll go on to, to dive into. But where did it all start? You come from a sporting background. Mm. Where where did fitness start in your life? When people say that, I'm like, man, I'm getting old. That's the first thing. Or when they compliment, like, oh, yeah, man, you've, you're OG. And then secondly, I'm always like, man, I feel there's always that little bit of imposter syndrome. Like, oh, my gosh, if you only knew, like, you know, the, the struggles, you know, at times we all go through. But I think for me, it started with sports. Mm. I was, you know, one of seven kids. My dad was a high school basketball coach. 
he himself, you know, was a college athlete, a uh, high school teacher. My brother now is a high school basketball coach. So we grew up just nonstop sports. It was football, basketball, baseball, track, even wrestling. So I grew up, you know, trying to do, trying to do everything. And then as I got into high school, kind of honed things down. But for me, the love with like weights started at an early age with, with me especially, not my brothers and sisters, you know, everyone played sports, but I was the only one that took up weights like, like it was, you know, my, my passion. Everyone else did it because my dad made them, they had to, but I tell this story often, like I was six, seven, eight years old. We'd be watching TV, football game, basketball game or whatever during commercial breaks push-ups. My dad was having me do push-ups, 50 push-ups. So I got to the place where I was, you know, really early on had a decent, you know, muscular physique at 12, 13, 14 years old, was able to bench press, you know, 110 kg in the sixth grade. So at like 12, 13. So like s silly in terms of like where I was at with, with strength and upper body, lower body was good. Um, you know, not as, as great as the upper body. So it was, it was for me all for sports that then quickly became a passion of its own. Why did your dad choose you, do you think, for doing push-ups? Or was everyone doing push-ups at six, seven years old? I think I, I was the one that ended up kind of liking it. So everyone else, I think, kind of complained where I, I kind of just took to it and, and almost any physical challenge. I was that kid that like, I wanted to be the fastest. I wanted to be the strongest. So he would challenge me, I think, in almost like that dad kind of way, like, oh, I bet you can't do this. Or I remember we were on the track one time running 400 meters. This is, you know, I'm in sixth grade. I'm 13, 14 years old. And he, he said to me like, oh, you know, a minute 36 for a kid running a 400 meter, you know, a minute 36 wasn't, wasn't bad, but he's like, Bo Jackson at your age would have done it. And, you know, and this, and looking back, I'm like, my dad was so manipulative. But <laughs> here I was as this kid, like, oh my gosh, I gotta be Bo Jackson. But it, of course we had no idea what, you know, Bo Jackson really ran it in. Um, but it was things like that, that I just was naturally competitive. I wanted to be the best in things. And I think also growing up, like you're 35, mm. growing up, Looking up to people like, I remember watching TV like on, I remember TNT was a station we had and like on Friday night there was always like a really manly man movie, whether it was like Bloodsport with Jean-Claude Van Damme or Stallone, like Rockies, obviously Arnold. Um, but those were like the action figures. Like those were, today we have Marvel Avengers yeah. and things like that. That's kind of who I think the young kids look at now. But like for me growing up, it was it was those those guys that were always big and strong. So I was kind of that's who I wanted to be like. So did did Jim at that time play a good role in making you a better athlete to play you know, sports yeah. as well? Because obviously yeah. sports in America is huge. Or or did you kind of move away from sports and focus solely on gym through those teenage years? I definitely was more sports focused up until about twenty three. So I played college football at a place called. Dixie State. It's now called Utah Tech. Um, but we were, you know, I started out at Boise State and then went to Snow Junior College, then ended up at, at Dixie. And I played linebacker. So I was kind of a, you know, in a, in a rugby sense, I would have, I would have actually felt like I would have been a better rugby player than a football player because growing up, I played running back and linebacker. So I, my job in high school was they would hand the ball off to me and I would, I would run just, you know, like, you know, what you would see, you know, in my crude understanding of rugby, it's like you got you have a guy running the ball and you have a guy trying to tackle ball. There's obviously a lot of a lot more talent and skill that goes into that. But I look at rugby and I'm like, man, that would have really fit to my skill set mm. that I had in football. But I was a good high school football player. I was playing the wrong position. So in college, I moved to linebacker and was a three year starter, you know, was a good college linebacker. Not great. Not good enough to go to the NFL. So that's kind of where that dream ended and then fitness had always been like I was always that guy who would do my exercises my compound lifts you know the back squat you know even some cleans hang cleans mostly in college um you know all, all of the things we do to get stronger on a strength program that we did but then I was always hitting the extracurricular stuff you know always arm day gun show you know worrying about you know the aesthetic side of things from day one I was I was always interested in aesthetic you know, bodybuilding yeah. from Arnold. Steve Reeves was another one of my guys that I really looked up to because I think he just had a classic, you know, physique, but was also back in the day and age where like 
no one was using PEDs. Like he wasn't, you know, he was a natural guy. I really liked what he kind of set up as like these ideal dimensions. I can remember studying Steve Reeves and he would talk about like, okay, if your waist is this big or you're this tall, you should weigh this much. Your neck should be this big. Your arm should be this big. And that balance, that kind of symmetry really to me made sense. Nice. And those, those early years coming out of high school and stuff, or, or you call it college, did you go straight then into the fitness space as a means to make money or was it, did you, what yeah. was work? Cause I think most guys kind of my age have grown up in the fitness industry, in the, right. fitness, industry, in the, fit, in the fitness industry alongside you, you know, you're a couple of years older than me. And I think the early days of like body powers and expos and things is yeah. where I first met you, but you were then fully in the fitness space right. then, you know, the face of big brands, supplement, supplement brands, clothing brands, et cetera. But before that, how did you, yeah. how did you work your way to that, to that space? I think the biggest thing for me was after I got done with, football i do the nfl was no longer in the cards for me so what was that a viable option at one stage it was you know i, I tried out for mm. you know i had a tryout for some nfl scouts i actually had a fracture in my ankle um that kind of again if there was any gray area if i was going to you know try to pursue it you know go to you, you know the cfl at the time wasn't even a thing but the canadian football league like there was other there, there's other outlets now for guys. When I was there, it was kind of NFL or nothing. Like yeah. NFL Europe, I think had just been canceled. It was a thing for a minute. Um, so that fracture happened, and you know I wasn't you know it really I could see that it wasn't going to work out. So I quickly kind of was like, man, what do I do now? I've told the story before where I was married at the time, um, married young at 21 years old, was just finishing up. I think I had maybe a year of school left. Went through a divorce. You know, we've I've talked to, to to people about, you know, on my YouTube and everything about, you know, going through a divorce at 23, 24 years old, you know, when you, you shouldn't even be married necessarily mm-hmm. at that point. Went through a divorce. My wife actually at the time, she stepped outside the marriage with a, a doctor. She was a nurse. She, you know, and for me, that was like, oh, man, I just had gotten done playing football. There was an identity crisis for me because I was no longer a husband. I was no longer a football player. I wasn't, you know, I hadn't finished my college degree. So it was a massive time in my life where there was like, hey, put up or shut up. You got to do something with your life here. What, what you thought what you thought you were and what you are, there's not the same thing anymore. So mm-hmm. it's time to sit down and, and, and really almost go through this. Who are you? You know, who are you? What do you want to do? What do you want to be about? That's when... And I was working at Texas Roadhouse, um, prepping for the muscle and fitness male model search. This is before there was a men's physique category. Um, I competed in a couple natural bodybuilding shows. All of that kind of led to me doing the bodybuilding.com spokes model search. And I I won that. Signed with Optum Nutrition. Men's physique kind of came about at the same time. So I was the third men's physique pro. And all of a sudden, it was just kind of right space, right time Mm. with some really cool partners. The fitness space at that time was kind of shifting from only big bodybuilders made a living. It used to be just like if you weren't a top three bodybuilder on the Olympia stage, there was no real money in the fitness industry. And I can remember vividly shooting in Los Angeles um, for a website that I don't even know if it's around, like MuscleRx is what it was called. And the photographer, Bill Comstock, said, like, Steve, you know, like, you got a, you know, you got a good physique, but like, you're not a bodybuilder. What are you doing? You're not going to, you're not going to make any money. Like, what, what's your, what's your goal? And I was just like, well, I'm with Optimum Nutrition. I'm with bodybuilding.com. Like, I want to travel the world. I, w- I want to, you know, and then YouTube came around. So I started doing YouTube, started going to, you know, 10 expos a year, just did tons of traveling for these various companies, meeting people, standing in a line for eight to 12 hours. Never, never felt like that to me was work. I just loved meeting people, talking about their fitness goals, doing YouTubes in these places. And that ultimately led it to where we are now, essentially to this, you know, I guess this making a career out of fitness. Yeah. I want to get on to talking about how you start working with brands because you mentioned, mentioned Optimum, yep. but you said something there that's quite I think quite prudent with some of the audience because they, a lot of the people, high achievers I know have, have have achieved something in one domain or had one identity and then something's happened, it's an inflection point and they might move into something Mm -hmm. else. Typically for me or historically it's been with sport and then moving into fitness. For you, it's been sport moving into fitness. And you mentioned the identity kind of crisis or identity change. How did you manage that situation? What did it feel like back then? And and how long did that, that process take? 
you know, I, I think it it took probably a good three, three, four years, and it was still always kind of like, I, you know, I'll, I'll even – I still identify as an athlete, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of like, I, I think that there's people in the fitness industry, especially in the bodybuilding industry, I'll say this, that they might look a certain way, but if you were to ask them to do something functional, or if you were to ask them to hand-eye coordination, for example, it, it's just not there. And so that, it was always important for me to always stay athletic, to always stay mobile, functional. And that's why I always, I think having performance goal was massive for me you know mm. big big thing that i've always said is be an instrument not an ornament don't just look a certain way be be someone who's who can who can do things as well but that identity crisis definitely i think for me took a good three or four years it wasn't like you know i i sat down and mapped out you know who i now wanted to be it's just i had passion for exercising i had passion for helping people out and i was fortunate enough to be involved with companies at the time that were growing like crazy that wanted to utilize me and a following that you know I started to have and it was just a, you know good timing in a lot of ways yeah people talk about getting lucky but it's preparation and timing when they meet right and you, I think you have been the poster boy for this new age of, of, of bodybuilders that aren't your typical massive bodybuilders and you, you've named some of them that we can we can remember you've also mentioned optimum nutrition I think that's where I first came across you it's, yeah. it's going to those expos more as a consumer than necessarily like uh, an athlete or a um, fitness model or whatever I wanted to call myself back then. Optimum being one of them, Jim Sharp being a more you know, a more recent one, and they might have happened around the same time. I don't really know, but I remember the bodybuilding.com stages and the and the Optimum ones. So how did that happen? Was it just right place, right time? Brands were looking for a new direction, a new kind of pinup poster boy. Yeah. What were you doing other than YouTube that, that attracted brands? So I, I wasn't even actually doing YouTube when I first started with those two. The way I got involved, I actually got first involved with, bodybuilding.com mm. um i was i'm from boise idaho originally bodybuilding.com is from boise idaho so after i got done playing college football moved back to boise idaho bodybuilding.com was at that time just a massive company selling other brands products and they had a lot of information on their site as well so it was kind of the place to go again bodybuilding.com it speaks for itself but they also had a lot of nutrition advice they were just this they had massive traffic to their their site. So I remember I would actually volunteer my time as being just a model for, you know, their website. If they needed someone like taking a bite out of a protein bar, I think there's like me, I don't even know what the protein bar was, but like shirt was off. I was getting into bodybuilding at the time. I was like, my dream was to, you know, stand alongside Jamie Eason, who was their spokeswoman at the time. She was great. You know, just so much of what I learned from her and how she interacted with people at Expos, so much of what I do, I learned from her. But I just volunteered like, hey, I'm going to work at Texas Roadhouse. I volunteered at bodybuilding.com. I prepped for the muscle and fitness male model search after kind of going back and finishing my my degree. After I won that muscle and fitness male model search and, you know, had a had a, like a cover shoot with muscle and fitness, I was Gaspari nutrition was actually like the title sponsor of it and (laughs) it's so funny because to this day they 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 handed me like i think the winner was supposed to get like 500 dollars or something and i was pretty stoked about that because i was just a broke college kid but they like handed me this envelope i go backstage and i'm expecting a check or a contract or something and it was just empty it was just like there was nothing in it they just handed me an envelope on stage just to give me something (laughs) and and so i thought i actually was you know gonna be talking with them and and nothing kind of happened from that. But then Optimum Nutrition came along and they're like, hey, you know, like we 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 love, you know, we saw you on stage. We love what you were doing there. Um, I then really quickly after that, I signed a contract with them. It was basically like both them and bodybuilding.com. I think it might have been a couple hundred dollars a month, but free supplements and free supplements at the time. Like when you're a 23, 24 year old kid and you love the gym, it's like, I think between the two, I had like 750 or a thousand dollars of supplements a month I could get. And so I was actually slinging supplements on the side to like (laughs) my local, my local like, um, supplement retailer would just buy the supplements. I'd make it cheaper for him. He, so I was like making an extra $500 off of that. And then they were paying me. And I think, you know, between the two, I was probably making, you know, five to $700 a month as well. So not enough to live on. Um, but that's how I got started with both of them. I was, you know, contract and then when i won the spokes model search for bodybuilding.com um you know i did a lot of competitions in this time that were both 
um, spokes model searches. And then because m- men's physique wasn't around yet, it was kind of the muscle and fitness male model search was almost like a testing, like a pilot almost mm. to see how men's physique would do. And obviously it was super popular. So they started that division. But yeah, I was fortunate enough to kind of have bodybuilding and optimum at the same time. Optimum definitely being though my main my main like that's who I traveled with. I would always go to expos, be with bodybuilding.com, spend two hours on the sorry, I was with Optimum, but I'd spend like two hours on the bodybuilding.com stand. They would both would have big, you know, stands at these expos. And so it was almost like each each big supplement company had their athletes that would go to bodybuilding.com stand because bodybuilding.com sold all these various supplements. Mm. So we would, you know, it, it was almost like I was getting exposure from both of them, which was a, really a, a good thing. So that's where Steve Cook's wholesale started, was it? Yeah, <laughs> honestly, at the time, like looking back, I, I, I was like, man, like it was, I was fortunate because these companies had eyeballs, like social media. We had Facebook at that time. Mm. Instagram wasn't even a thing in 2010 when this was all happening. 2010, 2011, like Instagram hadn't yet. So I was on Facebook and then I dated a girl who her brother was massive on YouTube, like vlogged every single day. And I was like, I'm going to get into this YouTube thing. And I think I remember at the time, like on YouTube back in the day, the only other fitness person, there was like two, there was, I think Scott Herman and then Mike Sixpack abs, like Mike Chang, six pack abs. I don't know if you remember him. I remember six pack abs. Yeah. yeah. That was his big product. I don't know what happened to him. And then of course there was Greg Plitt too, Mm. who really, you know, kind of started doing YouTube about the same time, but also was like, he was, he was the main man in the fitness industry that wasn't a bodybuilder, but was a cover model. Yeah. So it sounds like that your, your career is beginning to gather some traction there. When did Olympia come into it? When did you start to yeah. Yeah, move towards the more professional side yeah. of competing. So right around this time, I got done, you know, I signed with Optimum, signed with bodybuilding.com. Um, the, IF, the, the MPC and the IFBB then announced that, hey, we have this new classic or we have this new men's physique division. Mm. It's more of a classic look. I don't want to say classic bodybuilder, but more of it's a classic look, more of a Steve Reeves, like board shorts, you know, the 1950s, 60s, golden era type stuff. I was like, oh, this sounds perfect. I was a natural bodybuilder at the time. I could then do men's physique and 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 stay natural doing mm. men's physique. So I won. I won the second. What was it? The second uh, national level NPC show where I got my pro card. Then so I was the third men's physique pro of all, ever. And then I had to wait almost like a year before there started being enough pro shows because they didn't have enough pros to have pro shows yet. So I won the first. Olympia qualifying show, the Houston Pro. I, I, I won that, and so I was the first person to qualify for the men's physique, Mr. Olympia. So I was just kind of on this winning streak. You know, I'd won bodybuilding.com, spokes model search. I'd won a fit body search, the muscle and fitness model search. I got my pro card. So I was kind of like on cloud nine. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I want to be the first ever Mr. Olympia men's physique. That's powerful. And I thought for sure, like, I was going to win this competition. I thought was, I was what they were looking for went into the Olympia and lost. And that was the first time I was like, whoa, you know, like there's in within the fitness industry, the competing space, it's so subjective. There was also some political things happening with agents. Like there was, there was management and agents that if you weren't with these specific management teams, you weren't going to place in certain positions like and and I, I really hate saying that because I'm never one for for politics like it doesn't matter like win or lose like it but it was one of those things that it was so bad that a couple years later it had to be disbanded like that management group no longer could you know could like optimum nutrition said Steve if you sign with this management team we won't represent you like you can't be an optimum nutrition athlete and be a part of that management group. based on their reputation based on the reputation and just like it was it was it just wasn't real management it was it was kind of a, it was for lack of a better word it was just to get better placing essentially yeah. so um the dark side of the of the bodybuilding world you know th- it definitely exists it definitely there is um just anytime you have people in power there's always people that are going to take advantage of of those who aren't in power and i think that in the competing world, you hear it all the time. At the end of the day, it's subjective. You go from one show to a different show, they're going to say different things. You know, I know people 
that are always, you know, oh, the judge said I needed this. So they work on that. And then it's always that like, oh, I'm, I'm eventually going to get there. But ultimately, it's a subjective sport. Mm. It doesn't come down to, you know, who crosses the finish line first or who jumps the highest or who lifts the most weights. To me, bodybuilding, men's physique, it's not a sport. It's more of like art. How many times did you go back to Olympia? I did the Mr. Olympia twice. Yep. And it, the second time I did, I just realized like, it wasn't for me. It was like I, I at that time I was taking some testosterone, um, that second Olympia, and the coach I was with, there was just like, hey, if you want to be competitive, there's this, this, and this you need to take. And I don't even remember the names of it. Some of the things I didn't even had never even heard of, like Halo something. And I was just like, yeah, if I do that, I'm not going to be that functional, that athlete, that health driven, like. I did this because I loved health and all of a sudden I feel like it's just absorbing who I am and it's becoming unhealthy. And then on top of that, there is like the eating disorder side of things that looking back, I had an eating disorder. Like I would chew food and spit it out. Like working at Texas Roadhouse when I was competing and stuff, I would take bites of things and in my head, like I would, I would binge eat essentially. If I had one bite of something that I shouldn't, floodgates would open and I would just, you know, I'd binge like a whole night. And then post show, everyone knows, you know, post show, everyone blows up 10, 12 pounds, like in three days. And, and I just hated feeling like that inflammation and everything else. So it was, it was quickly, it was just a roller coaster of highs and lows with competing. And I don't think it has to be like that. Like I have an addictive personality. So I was like, if I'm competing, I'm going all in on something. How old were you at that stage? I was probably 26 ish, 25, 26, 27. That's kind of that time in my life. Was that the end of your comp competing? Um, yeah, I think I did my last show. I did just the, the Hawaii pro. Maybe that would have been 2017. Just kind of did it for fun. And I never want to say I'm never going to compete again. Like I really enjoy the process of prepping for a show again, because I'm that type of personality that, that needs structure and needs focus. The idea of waking up in the morning, knowing what I'm doing that day, um, knowing that, Hey, I have, I have my week split set out. I know I'm going to be doing hot yoga once a week. I'm doing swimming once a week. Like when I prepped, I always did it in a way, you know, I was kind of telling you, I actually did CrossFit after I got done playing football. I got with a CrossFit coach who was an ex bodybuilder. This is like 2009 when CrossFit was still in it's like conceptual, like they were at the ranch in Wisconsin. Mm. Um, and I, I did like CrossFit for like a year while doing bodybuilding as well. So like I would, I would, um, do like a core CrossFit kind of, you know, warm up strength stuff, some Olympic lifting, um, even like a Metcon. And then I would do some auxiliary stuff. And I actually, I think that might've been the best all around shape I've ever been in, in terms of, I won a, I won the bodybuilding.com fit model search, a different one than the spokes model search, but I won that contest the same day at the expo there was a pull-up bar where they were doing a pull-up competition and I did 42 strict pull-ups. Like at the time, most people thought if you're a body, if you're doing a bodybuilding show that day, you always see people like the depleted water. They feel like mm. shit. Like they get off their bodybuilding stage and they're just like, Oh, I'm so like my, my joints, everything. The way I prepped for that show and the way I competed and, you know, had sodium and carbs I actually felt great that day to the point where like, I was super strong. I did my 42 pull-ups. I, I won like $200 for, for winning that, that pull-up contest. So I was like, man, looking back, I'm like, there was something to the way I was training right then that, that I was onto something. There's a lot to be said about functional training and bodybuilding, whatever those terms mean to people. But yeah. when I used to first go to the expos and when I was first involved with that, that side of the industry as a, as a fitness model, I never competed or anything, but my USP, my, my brand at the time was called Functional Physique. So my USP was that I looked like a bodybuilder and I could maintain like low body fat percentage. Yep. I walked around, I could, you know, looked comparable to the guys at these expos with their tops off, but I trained in a very different way. So, right. so there's a lot to be said about it. And I think even now for longevity, particularly as we age, like training in a functional manner, so you're working multi-joint exercises, full range of motion, but you're still getting hypertrophy and bodybuilding in to, to maintain and build muscle tissue. I think so. a great way to train. I mean, and that's, you, you hit the nail on the head. There's, there's progressive overload that bodybuilding is kind of based on. Um, I think when you look at, you know, if, if I look at a program, I'm going to want to make sure 
if if I'm I'm any good program, like I want to have a strength progression. Like I'm trying to get stronger, especially if eventually I want to be bigger. A stronger muscle will be a bigger muscle because we're able to take more weight through that hypertrophy rep range. Um, ultimately, too, though, it's like I remember these people that you know I can remember at different times. People back, like, oh, you don't need cardio to get lean. You can just you know through proper diet you can stay lean, and that's true. But cardio is great for our heart. Our heart mm-hmm. is a muscle as well. We need cardio. So I love this idea of again when I was prepping. I would swim. I would do my like swim sprints, not long distance swimming. Um, I would have more of an endurance day, like a 5K day, and then I'd have some lifts. Um, that on top of you know eating right and kept me fairly lean. But when you go to like four percent body fat, I think there's a big difference in like there's CrossFitters out there that look phenomenal. And I remember doing a video with some CrossFit people at the time um it was Brooke Ince and her then husband that I went to college with and we we talked about this in in the CrossFit in the functional space for a while there was like especially I would say 2017 16 there was like bodybuilding CrossFit like they were so like Mm. now we don't see that as much anymore there's so many things out there there's there's so many other avenues um where it's like no we we see now that some functional work with some hypertrophy work or with some, with some auxiliary lifts, you know, if you are a CrossFitter and you hit biceps at the end of the workout, you're going to get teased back in the day in a CrossFit Mm -hmm. space. Nowadays, it's like, it's not weird to go in and see someone in a CrossFit gym doing some single arm dumbbell bench press, like seeing some auxiliary work being done because ultimately you're going to be better off for it. Yeah. You, uh, just taking you back to what you mentioned there about like, uh, some disordered eating. Like I can, I can certainly relate to that too. I think, in that side of the, the fitness industry, it's kind of part and parcel of, I think later down the line, you get perspective of what you were doing wasn't really, what was potentially disordered. But when you're in it, you don't necessarily identify as, as, as behaving that way. What gave, you the, what gave you the insight that you were, did you think chewing food and spitting out the time was, was kind of normal? Or did you know you're doing something? Oh, I thought it's completely normal. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was weird. The binge eating, I did know like, hey, this isn't good. Like, especially the post-show binging where I would... Mm. Essentially, if you've never done a bodybuilding show, I'm sure it's it's like any any other thing in life you have. You have this goal. You're working every single day, multiple hours. It'd be like a triathlon or getting ready for, you know, a competition that like you put it on a pedestal. It is like it is your reason for existing for the next 10 to 12, 16 weeks. Everything you do is based around that. Your sleep, your eating, your training. You get on stage. You're on stage maybe for seven minutes total. You get off stage and there is a whether you win or lose, there is a post-show blues. You might win and think, oh, my gosh, my life's going to change and nothing changes. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, that was all for nothing. And then I would find myself winning a show. But the next day, kind of walking the streets in Santa Monica where I lived at the time, like stuffing my face with donuts. Remember eating like a dozen donuts and just feeling just feeling like like shit, like well, what am I doing here? Like, this isn't, I want to be about health, but when the pendulum swings that far and you make your only goal and again, identity about how you look, you're never going to look better than you did on stage or maybe the morning after people look great the morning after when they have a cheat meal. But then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, what's the goal now? So I always Mm -hmm. tell people actually two days ago, there was a girl that, that, you know, goes to our gym back in Utah who did a show. I'm like, change it up to a performance goal, reverse diet, change it up to a performance goal. And I think that's where people in the functional space, CrossFit and whatnot, they never probably get to that 4%. They never get to that insanely, insanely lean, which to go from seven or 6% down to four or high 3%, it's so much harder. Like you're squeezing every last, you know, cardio session and things like that. So I think it's, I would much rather look and I think people actually look better when they're in that seven, eight percent. Yeah. If you need to get down to six percent for a shoot, great. But it's healthier. If like for me, I can live under ten percent and still be fairly normal. Um it's just, you know, the volume of training might go up. I might do you know, a couple, you know, it's it's not necessarily looks looks driven. It's more like I, I can still maintain a, a an aesthetic physique with functional training worked into things yeah i've spoke to it before when i came out of rugby where everything was around fueling for, uh, for performance i didn't go into crossfit which was there at the time but yeah. it, it didn't really it didn't really appeal to me i went into the fitness industry to grow my personal training business and at the time i felt like my personal brand had to grow at the same time mm. and my personal brand was more in that 
uh, fitness model aesthetic side of the business or side of the industry. And I found myself doing a lot of those, doing a lot of those things. It was all about aesthetics, and I thought my credibility and my self worth was based on how I looked. So I did a lot of the, a lot of the same things. I, I don't remember ever chewing food and spitting out, but binges. There was a lot of restriction and then binging. Yeah. There was a lot of managing calories and what I was eating to the nth degree. I found myself going. My wife talks about it. We went on holiday once out the country, and I took weighing scales on yeah. holiday, and I'd take them out to to dinner with me. It was more of a control measure. Because I, like you, that sort of personality where I'm, I'm all or nothing. And most of the time I'm, I'm all, I'm, yeah. I'm never really nothing. I'm, I'm always all. So if I'm binging, I'm all in. Right. If I'm being restricted on something, I'm, I'm going all in. And it was more of a control measure because it arguably me taking the scales or not taking the scales wasn't going to impact the way I looked. Like it, it, it wouldn't, but it, it was a, for me, I knew that if I took them, then I was in control of what I was doing. And it's like a badge of honor. Like, exactly. look at me, I'm, I'm, I'm in control of this. Like it is like. I'm almost suffering more than the next person because mm. I want it more. It's almost like the the grind mentality. We hear about people like grinding, you know, like on their business or whatnot. That was the equivalent of it in the fitness space. Yeah, and I, I just normalized the whole thing. I remember once going to my, my mother-in-law's um, house for a Sunday roast and she'd cook this dinner. And I was unsure of what was in the dinner, right? This is how bad it was. So I've gone to the bin to find the packet to yeah. see what the what the ingredients were yeah. in this food that she'd put in the thing. That was my life for about five years. I know I know that feeling of, you know, being someplace, eating something, and then frantically calling up restaurants. Hey, what did you use? Yeah. What did you put that in? And looking back, I'm like, man, they must have thought I was crazy or had some disease that like, you know, maybe they thought I was celiac and worried about certain things. But I was I was just Hey, did you put butter on that steak? Like there was so many little things that, again, when you get to that level of competition, like you're trying to get, even if it's 1% mm. better, you know, it's going to make a difference. So it's hard to say that like, you know, some obsessiveness is going to occur naturally because you're trying to, you know, be the best you can be. But ultimately for lifestyle and quality of life, you have to learn how to separate if you are f competing in that. There has to be a, a, a big like, okay, hey, I do that for 12 weeks, but I don't do it yeah. year round. I don't, you know, I have a friend who's counted macros for seven years straight, basically. Um, he doesn't have a family. He doesn't have kids. Like he's able to do it, but he's able to eyeball things now. And he kind of, he doesn't have an addictive personality necessarily where it has to be perfect. And that's, I think, what I've kind of learned over the years. Like I don't have to be perfect that idea of perfection actually is going to hold you back in the long run because again, it, it, it promotes this all or nothing mentality, which ends up just yo-yo dieting. Yeah. So wrapping up that, that stage of your life, like what's your thoughts on competing now? Like you mentioned you might go back to it. So I think I understand kind of how you feel about it, but yeah. for, for people either coming into the industry or, or people considering like competition from a bodybuilding standpoint, like would you, do you think it's a worthwhile exercise once um, give it a go? Well, I, I'll answer that qu question kind of in a couple different parts. It's a great way to, if if someone has the idea or the passion to compete into it, like I, I talk to even a lot of girls who compete in bikini, um, I always ask them like, why? Well, I just want to do it for me. Mm. That, okay, I just want to do it for me then turns into, I just want to get a pro card. And then the pro card all of a sudden becomes like, well, I just want to do, you know, I just want to do an, you know, a pro show or the Olympia. So there's this idea of like, hey, I'm, I just want a little bit. And then there's, we're human humans. You know, we, we, we are never content necessarily with what we have. So I think it's identifying why you want to do the show. Cause there's a lot of great things that you, you know, you learn how to be structured in your, in, in your life. Um, you learn how to count macronutrients, which I think, I don't know about in England, but in the U S I think they should learn how to teach reading food labels um, and what, you know, what really nu good nutrition looks like. And even if that means keeping a week long journal of what your food you ate and then how many macros were in them. Great. I don't think you need to do it your whole life, but I think having an idea of what you're putting in your body is essential. And a lot of people learn that in bodybuilding. Um, I, I doubt I'll ever compete again. Like I, I don't want to say never, because again, I like the process of it, but uh, for me, it ends up being something that, you know, you can quickly turn unhealthy if you're that type of person. So I really think competing for people, it's based, it's individual to individual. Some people I, I know can compete and they're very healthy with it. Other people, I would say the majority of people have to find that balance because most people who compete 
um, end up losing kind of themselves in it. Yeah, I think in competition for a lot of people, at least my experience of when speaking to people, it gives them something to prepare for, like something yep. to prep for, but then it becomes all about the destination and not necessarily about the journey to get there. Yes. And if the, in the journey to get there, the, the means and methods aren't conducive with what's sustainable for the long term, then it's kind of a, a one-way ticket to, to nowhere in terms of the, the overriding goal. Perfect to piggyback on that. This is the perfect example. I was at the at the Gymshark event um, about a week and a half ago, two weeks, and I was sitting there with a, a live sit-down session with a uh, a guy. You know, he's an influencer. His name's Cody Co. And he, we were talking uh, about finding that balance and, and and really like there's no such thing as true balance. There's just different point in times in your life you're giving attention to more areas, but whatever journey you're on, being happy in today, that's a hard thing for people because we're always goal oriented. It's always like, I'll be happy when I'm a millionaire. Mm. I'll be happy when I have my pro card. I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. So I was talking about how you need to find joy in the daily struggle, the daily process of going through it and be happy at the end of the day. I had a, a young girl, 18, years old. She had her younger brother with me. She came up, waited in line afterwards. And I was like, Steve, you know, I'm confused kind of by what you said. Kobe Bryant, his big tagline was like, job's not finished. Job's not finished. You know, like you got to keep striving. You got to keep pushing. How does that compare? Like how, how can you have that mentality if you are saying you need to learn how to be happy? And to me, it's those two things go hand in hand. If the job's never finished, if Kobe Bryant's trying to be the best basketball player in the world, if I'm trying to be the best X, Y, Z in the world, you're only there for such a small amount of time. Like it, if your whole life you're striving for something and you're never happy until you get there, then you're spending the majority of your life unhappy. Mm. Who wants to live like that? So Kobe Bryant, you know, the job's not finished. He was referring to a championship. Or we can even say he was referring to being the best basketball player in the world. But the idea that he wasn't happy every single day, that's a myth. Like he was happy with the effort he put in every single day to get better. If you're getting better every single day or if you are making strides to become the best version of yourself, you need to learn how to be happy in the journey, not the destination. And I think that kind of had a light bulb moment for the girl. She was like, oh, that that makes sense. Like even though the destination could be winning a championship or being the best CrossFitter, being Mr. Olympia – if you're not focused on those tiny little little details of winning winning the day, and that might just mean like, hey, I'm going to have my systems in place. I'm going to, and this could be with family. This could be with work. This could be with your individual training. If I know if I'm doing those tiny little things and I'm, I have the, I'm putting forth my best effort, at the end of the day, you should be able to live with the results if you are the best or if, you, if you're not because you've done everything you can. And that puts you in a spot where, you're going to be happy then knowing that you did everything. Yeah, that's power. How, how did you, so at 27, when you, when you kind of like start winding down competing, arguably your career has, has continued to accelerate the same rate in which it had, if not faster from, from back then. So without competition is the thing that can potentially get you in shape or that gives you more notoriety in that space. How do you feel as though you've accelerated and stayed relevant and credible from your 38 now, right? Yeah. For the last sort of decade. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to say I definitely saw spikes, you know, competing. It, it gives people like kind of whether it's a YouTube series, mm. you know, running a marathon, being a hybrid athlete, training for a high rocks, um, having a journey, to, no matter what it is, is on social media is going to make people more engaging. Buy into the story. Right. And I would say like for me, the last couple of years, I've kind of stepped away from being as active on social media, partly because trying to get my wife into the US took a two it was a two year process took all of my energy i mean i i attacked that like i attacked like a show like it was every single day for me and it was something out of my control and that was the first time in my life i'm sure like yourself if if we want to do something if we have this vision of what we want our lives to be like in our head we usually can achieve those things mm. but covid when you throw governments in place when you throw things that are out of your control it's difficult because now I can do everything in my power, but still my end goal of having my wife or whoever get into the country, start our lives, build, 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 it's not happening. And so I, I really, that was the first time I think uh, situational depression is kind of what, what it was referred to as. And I was like, I've never really 
you know, I've never really understood depression from a standpoint of like a clinical, like, yes, we've all been sad, but I've never understood like the debilitating aspect of being clinically depressed. I went through that in that time um, with just not being able to be together, with not being able to have our lives. And then you throw on top of it. To me, there was a lot of crazy things that went on with COVID that made me just scratch my head and say, like, how is this the world we're living in? How is mm-hmm. how is common sense not prevailing here? I think that was kind of a dark time in my life that social media took a backseat. And looking, you know, in hindsight now, I should have probably just taken a complete step away because I think, you know, I would, you know, especially on Twitter and stuff, like some people are like, you're a different person on Twitter. I, I love to debate and even argue, but it's never a personal thing. And I think I allowed sometimes because of the political identity in American politics, I allowed it sometimes to get a little bit too personal. And and so I think there was some times I was unhappy with, you know, who I was in my situation that I was kind of a person that I didn't love who I was at that time. But I definitely now coming out of that, having Morgan, now I'm like in this growth phase again where I'm excited to do YouTube, have goals with training. I think where your passion flows, like if you have passion in something, um, it, it and you share that and you're helping people unleash whatever their passion is. And there's that teaching aspect. I come from a family that are educators, they're teachers. So I think naturally, like I love helping people kind of get to the best version of themselves or get through a breakup because I've been there. Um, I think that there is, is that just naturally I have passion for. And people always ask like, hey, how do I grow a following? Do what you're passionate about. Be one of the best people educate yourself on on the matter mm-hmm. and if you have passion and if you have the knowledge and then if you're willing to share that there will always be a need for that yeah so how do you think that at your age now that is there anyone that's further down the track than you that you that you used to take inspiration from because the way i see it yeah that era probably aren't as relatable anymore yeah you're only a few years older than me but i think yeah. you're, you're still kind of paving the way and when i see other people ask me like should I accelerate what I'm doing in my 20s? Should I live my life in my 20s? Should yep. I wait until I'm 30 to start the thing? What is what is what does the fitness industry look like? I don't I can't see anyone further down the track that's like showing the path or right. what could be. Is there anyone that's doing that for you, or are you happy to be out in front, of kind of paving that way? Again, massive thing that I'm dealing with right now. So it's a, such a good thing that you're asking. I'm almost going through another identity shift. We talked about being that athlete identity shift from football player to now fitness, we'll call it competitor, Mm. cover model, spokesperson. Now I would say identity shift into, hey, I want to be more all around health, longevity, business builder, brand builder, and then leaning on experiences that I've had in the fitness industry to then help other people through it. So at some point, whether it's a podcast or whether it's, you know, consulting, whether it's, it's when you have those experiences, all of a sudden you've been in the fitness industry. I've been in the fitness industry. The, you know, the idea that, you know, like competing might not be in the cards or, but how many more people are, are better to speak on all of these issues that we're talking about than those who have lived through it. So now it's more of like a, Hey, get into an educator type role, get into that coach type role, get into to that role that you're really someone who's speaking from personal experience and you have knowledge because at some point, you know, we're all going to lose our looks, but if you've been there, if you've done that, if you've lived it, and now you can, again, help other people through it, that's, that's kind of the next step, I would say. So is that, is that kind of where you're taking your professional career in terms of consultancy, helping uh, building brands? Is there anything that you want to build of yourself I know yeah. you've got the gym and the app and things but yeah. is it consulting with other brands or bringing that into Steve Cook's that's a great yeah so for me right now I kind of look at it as um and I'll, I'll you know this is going to be more on my social media as well but hot as an press. influencer what's that it's going to be hot off the press yeah. well as an as an influencer you really need to be looking at in my opinion again your it, your brand's a shelf life it's not going to be around forever that's why I think it's important that you have kind of things into three categories brands that you have ownership in doesn't necessarily be 100%. It can be 100%. And that's what you're most passionate about. Mm. For me, that's, you know, fitness culture training, that's building that brand where, you know, where we're helping people, you know, with through the app. Um, And then also for me, like strength collective, that was my line with Gymshark. I'm gonna be taking that and doing my own thing. I'm really passionate about passionate about like clothing. 
passionate about training. Those are things that I want to invest my time. That's where I want to spend my time. And then there's the things that I'm passionate about, maybe not quite as passionate about, that I want to partner with people on, that I believe in what they're doing, that might be a long-term relationship. That can be supplements for me. Um, that could be um, even even like blood work, hormone panels, things like that, stuff that I believe in that, again, might not be my area of expertise, but I think is valuable. And then the last thing I would say is things you like that that are um, more one-offs. Like, you know, for me, it's could be a meal prep company. It could be, you know, a wearable. It's things that I might not have long-term partnerships with. Maybe they grow to that, but it's one-off, you know, brand collaborations. It's things that I, you know, see value in, but might not necessarily have long-term partnerships with. And that's kind of where I see, I, I put, if it's one of those things, if a brand comes to me, and if I can't put into one of those categories, then I usually don't do it. If I don't have a passion, that's kind of number one for it all. Yeah, that's really cool. What does training look like for you now? Now you're, I know you said you're training for a marathon, which is really cool. I'm, I'm excited I, to see that. Journey. Like today is like, the, I'm 16 days out or 16 weeks out from it. So today, day one. So, well, I mean, we've kind of started running a little bit. I'm just, it's like, hey, I, I did a half marathon. I always said like, I'm going to do a marathon at some point. Again, I was doing that on stage interview with Cody Co. And he was talking about running from LA to San Diego, which is like 130 miles. Mm. I was like, I'll do 26 with you. So when I said that, I was like, okay, well, better start training for it because I think that's going to be November. But the marathon I want to do is Hawaii. Um, I've just kind of circled that, haven't signed up for it. Maybe I should because I think that's probably one of the biggest things when committing. Yeah, committing to something. So that's the goal. I'm not a great runner. Like it's it's never been something that I've in, enjoyed even like when I did the half marathon, I got through it, but it wasn't like at the end, I wasn't like, I'm going to do another, another one of these next month. So it'll be, it'll be interesting, but always wanted to do it. Fine. So, so in the immediate future, it's, it's, it's running. Yep. What, what is your, I'm sure the people out there, you stay in great shape at 38 years old, right? And, and, and the last 25 years of training has probably got you there with the push ups from six years old. But yeah. what is it? Was a weekly sort of training program look like for you now? When I travel, it's a little bit different, but back, back home, um, usually there's a strength Monday, Tuesday, kind of strength work, upper body, lower body Monday, Tuesday. Um, and then it'll be a little bit more, I would say either a speed day with legs right now. I'm kind of nursing a, a lower back injury, which I kind of constantly have. So a lot more mobility mm. to stay healthy in that I have really tight hips. So instead of like tons and tons of back squats and hip hinge movements, I'm focusing a little bit more on probably single leg movements and also, um, stuff that would be almost considered like mobility stuff that might be a little bit weighted holding certain certain you know whether it's pigeon stretch or single leg box you know really focusing on glute activation rather than just big compound movements because for yeah. me everyone has different weaknesses with their body i've always had a long torso and a hard time activating glutes which has kind of led my lower back to be too activated like doing being too mobile, like your lower back shouldn't be moving too much in, mm. in, in these movements and mine has been. So it's kind of relearning and reeducating and, and really perfecting certain movements in, in my lower body and then staying strong upper body. Um, so it's Monday, upper body, Tuesday, lower body strength kind of days. And then, um, push pull legs, more of hypertrophy speed days, or more focusing on like single, um, single arm or single leg movements. Cool. So so work. You're getting some good strength compounds in the start of the week. Yep. And then more kind of hypertrophy towards the back end of the week. And yep. And even even the second, even muscular endurance stuff. So we'll work in some finishers. I love the idea of going in, kind of getting back to the athletic days. Um, instead of just walking on a treadmill, which I just people when, when I see people just walking on the treadmill, I'm just like, why? Well, there's so many like, you know, better things to get your heart rate up and you know, this has its place, especially when we start talking about training and CNS, like you, you, you know, you can definitely, if you're hitting a hard leg session and then doing a hit session, like your CNS is going to take a, a pounding. Um, but I do think if, if I have the choice between like, Hey, some circuit training, a Metcon or an IWT, mm. I'm going to throw that kind of stuff in there the second half of the week to really focus on some muscular endurance as well as, you know, some hypertrophy movements. Nice. So we've touched on kind of training and, and I guess next business ventures. Um, the other thing I had down here is I've seen you talk recently about kind of 
just your general well-being and, and health. I think you yep. put something on social media. You mentioned the kind of back injury and just like, I, I, I guess there's a bit of, like, is it tiredness from traveling and just where you're at? Or yeah, how, how are you? It is, I would say the back, like the, the body right now um, is years of athletic endeavors, like football. I, I played on, on the left side as a linebacker, so I always used this right side to hit. Mm. Like It was always right side taking on, you know, in football, it was taking on a pulling guard or a fullback a lot of the times. So this right side is just tra- from trauma. I have neck kind of shoulder down to that lower back, tight hips. Um, so that's where I'm, I'm kind of working those areas. Physical therapy is big for me right now. And again, getting back to single leg movements, but traveling the world for the last i would say 15 years doing expos definitely didn't help out you know sitting down on an airplane tight hip flexors so as stuff Mm. i think if if you're a young person out there take it from me like do your mobility work you know 10 minutes before a workout you know 15 minutes later on in the day i I like to try to split my mobility sessions more into like a an active warm-up you know pre-workout stuff and then if I can get in another 10 10 or 15 minutes later on even before bed it helps you actually sleep better um some some static stretching then some holds more of some like yoga type stuff I'm laughing because I can relate so much I mean my my body's probably (laughs) similar to you in terms of the uh the injuries and just aches and pains that I have and I think like hindsight's a wonderful thing and if I could look back I would have just uh, to be doing more mobility it's crazy like it's just you don't you don't you don't get up in the morning when you're 25, 26 and like can't stand up straight because your lower mm. back's just angry. Uh, so you don't think about those things, but it, it is like prehab that stuff, guys. It's like do do that do that work now. Whether it's like you know even Normatec, like my Theragun, I travel with that. My Hypervolt, I should say, I travel with that. Um, and banded work. It's just like even. It's so much, I always say it's it's so much harder to get in shape than to stay in shape. Mm. It's so much easier to just do a little bit of mobility than to get hurt and then have to do physical therapy. Like it's so much because your body, your body all of a sudden starts getting into these movement patterns where it wants to move a certain way. And if you're, if you're allowing it to move incorrectly, you're, you're just making it worse. It's like, it's like, you know, if a plane just veers off one degree eventually when it reaches its destination it's so far off if you have a bad movement pattern and you just allow it to go on over the years all of a sudden your body's really screwed up after 10 years yeah it's it's refreshing to hear someone that comes from such a like a aesthetically driven background so bought into performance and mobility and the way the body should move and Mm. strength training It's, it's really cool to hear um i'm really excited for this kind of next chapter of your life moving into a more they're representing wellness the aging male yeah. as someone who's only a couple of years behind you like i can relate to everything you're talking about and it's certainly something that i'm more interested in now with i've, I've recently bought infrared sauna at home an nice. ice bath um i find myself training less i find myself the, the quality of training needs to be up as it relates to like strength training and Love weights that. it's reduced to sort of three times a week i'm, I'm running a little bit more i've taken up jujitsu as a, as a as a hobby and a sport talk to me about that like how has that been not only just for your training, but being a newbie at something, mm. going in like it's it's fun to be bad at something and then see yourself progress. Like progressing is just in whatever it is, it's so fun to see. Yeah, I, I, to be transparent, like the, early on, I found it difficult because I was so bad, and it wasn't necessarily being bad. I, I didn't mind that because I knew that was going to be the, the case. It was more trying to organize my life so that I could fit jujitsu mm. in and give it the time it deserved to be able to get good at the rate in which I wanted to get good at right. because I was only training like once or twice a week tried to up the frequency I was training in the evening so that would then take I've got three kids so it would take time out of my my time with my kids right. so I was being quite selfish adding in a new thing for myself without taking something out right coupled with that 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 natural desire to want to train hard four five six times a week alongside taking on a new sport which involved me rotating, twisting, turning, moving in planes of motion, which I wasn't us- like natural, right. I wasn't used to, was then causing little niggles, aches and pains. So I had to just reassess kind of goals, why I was doing it, how I wanted to progress in it over the next six to 12 months. And now I've found a bit of a, a more of a, more of a rhythm with, with training. Um, it's a, every day is a school day when, yeah, when you're on the mats, which is, I, I guess, the beauty of right. it. Uh, you have to be, it's taught me a, a new level of patience. Um, and what I what I feel about 
it that truly is that I can I can see myself getting better for the next 10 15 years mm. because there's so much to learn and from a technical standpoint there I think it really is a journey ahead of you whereas when you get to 35 years old that's not to say you can't keep getting stronger or you can't get faster or you can't become more powerful but it does become yeah exponentially exponentially harder, harder. and the the juice probably isn't worth the squeeze at that right. stage for what you'd have to put into it from a recovery standpoint from nutrition and sleep and all those things so i think as naturally like your relationships begin to to build you, you have kids you know work becomes a little bit busier potentially mm -hmm. or more demanding jujitsu ju does allow you something where you can go you can completely switch off and be really present mm. and the learning rate is really fast and i don't think there's ever a stage given the people i've spoken to where the learning rate stops right because you're always unlike or you've the mastered thing. it it's interesting like as you were explaining that that has been my experience with golf i kind of asked you about yes yeah, so, so i actually some someone said yeah what's it like i don't play golf right. because for similar reasons of when i took up jujitsu like i was terrible right uh it was new things for my yeah. body that were kind of hurting and it was like time that i had to try and find that i didn't really have right but i said to someone i, I can imagine it's just like golf yeah where every time you're playing you're you're getting that incrementally a little bit better sometimes you'll go and train or you'll go hit some balls and it'll be terrible yeah. and you'll think you're back to square one but it's just compounding over time you just need to keep showing up it's so true and it, and even from i'm sure a lot of people like golf jiu-jitsu but even from a standpoint of like rotation stuff mm. like obviously you're doing it with another person acting as that force on your body with with golf obviously there's a club you're moving through a space but i've noticed that um geez talk about mobility like golf has really got me to doing a lot more mobility because if i don't i will get injured it's it's a violent movement of really uh, a rotation in the hips but it, like you said um switching off to such an important thing i really think for for men we tend to compartmentalize things like mm. we have to kind of have family time okay i have work time i'm switching off like i'm not great at we'll call it multitasking it's been showed like multitasking really isn't a uh, your brain can only concentrate on one thing, but golf has been that thing for me, especially during COVID. It kind of started where I could shut off. It, it took so much of my mental energy to focus on that, to be, to be all into it. And I imagine that's just how jujitsu is. You can't be mentally someplace else no. when you're on the mat. I can't be someplace else when I'm out there. And, and I love it because I'm out in nature, enjoying things like that. And it, Again, I can see myself 10, 15 years still being like, man, I'm trying to figure this this game out. And you never get to this place where there's a mastery of it. Um, and that's that's a beautiful thing, I think, that that keeps you young. Even if you're 50, 60, trying new things, developing new neural pathways and and becoming a better version of yourself because you're ultimately, you know, you're you're working in a new way, whether it's physically or mentally, working things out. Like obviously we know like Sudoku and and crossword puzzles. We always see elderly people doing that and how great that is for their mind. This is kind of like, you know, a 30, 40 years old doing something, having not necessarily a new purpose, but a new practice, a new hobby. Again, that excitement, I feel like a kid out there. Like yeah. it's, it's generally fun for me to go out there and, 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 and hit. And a lot of times I'm angry because I suck at it, <laughs> but it keeps me coming back. Yeah. I think that's the, it's kind of the nature of what without limits is, is, is there for it's, it's the lifetime of learning and the perception that there is always something that you can go and learn and start from scratch mm. and get better at. That means that like this, this, this decay, even as we get older, doesn't have to be there because there's something that can physically and mentally stimulate you right. and keep you pushing. Um, to wrap up, man, this has been such a cool episode. To wrap up, like, what does the next five, ten years look like? I think for me, it's going to involve having some some kiddos. That's probably a big one, and then getting back to kind of the brands, really focusing on those brands that that I have control over. Because I do think, as an influencer, you know, being with Jim Shark for for as long as I was, being with Optimum, being with Bodybuilding.com, you see kind of a life cycle of a brand or even of an influencer. And if you don't have something that you're truly passionate about, work wise. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, if that brand disappears or changes or becomes something that you're no longer, um, you know, essentially, you know, a part of, again, where 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 are you putting your time and energy? So I would I would really encourage people out there that you know are wanting to be picked up by partnerships. It's great because a lot of times, you know, their the eyeballs, their followers become your followers, and vice versa. But ultimately, have something that's your own as well. And I think so it's concentrating on those brands that I have complete control over, working on those longtime partnerships, um, really 
I want to do a podcast. As you can tell, I love talking. <laughs> um, and then the family aspect of things, probably ending up in Australia, close to the beach, you know, jumping in with, with the kiddos going down and, and, and swimming while having kind of that balance. We always talk about striving for balance while having kind of that in place um, is kind of kind of the dream. Yeah, it's been awesome. So, Steve, as I said to you at the start, you, you're an inspiration to many, uh, myself and everyone that I've mentioned that you're coming on. I've been super excited. Sweet. I think that's been a really cool episode. Just to unpack your story, how you've got to where you are, you continue to lead at the front. I think um, many people take motivation from what you're doing. And I think this new lease of life into fatherhood and, like I say, a maturing athlete. And I think it's going to be, um, it's going to make interesting watching. So, I'm excited about it. Thank you for being you, bro. Appreciate it.